From Nashville, Tennessee, Music City, USA, and the home of Hot Chicken, it's the Rick Altizer Show. Sit back, buckle up. Rick will talk with the movers, shakers, and creators who put Christ in Christian entertainment. He's a man who's clear so the world can hear. Here's Rick Altizer. Well, thank you for joining me today for the Rick Altizer Show. I have a very special guest today. Get ready to laugh. I have Christian comedian Johnny W. You might have seen him touring with Tim Hawkins on the Rockstar Comedy Tour. Maybe you've seen him on Juice TV. I was actually in the audience on that show, wasn't I, Johnny? You were. You oh, were, man, you were I can't believe it. <laughs> anyway, I'd like to welcome to the show Johnny W. Johnny, thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. It's wonderful. Well, Good it's a here. pleasure. It's a pleasure having you. We actually did this interview, and it didn't record. <laughs> and Johnny is being very uh, unbelievably gracious to me. Yeah. And I'm feeling, we talked in the interview that you didn't hear yeah. about embarrassing moments. We did. And this was, and I had mine. Yeah. You get one more chance. Uh, <laughs> it's recording now. I'm seeing I'm gonna... it. I'm verifying that we're actually fil- recording this. <laughs> it's fine. So uh, my listeners don't, you know, sorry, guys, but this is just what happens in the, in the real world of, yeah. of, of high-tech in the radio. Yeah. High-tech radio. Well, luckily, it's a comedian today, so it's like, what am I going to do? There's nothing else going on in my day. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I slept in, whatever. It's yeah. fine. Well, you've got a new DVD coming out September 6th. It's live at the Franklin Theater, mm-hmm. and uh, uh, you can get more info about Johnny, his comedy, uh, his video clips, and his new DVD if you go to johnnyw.com, and that's a J-O-N-N-I-E. That's right. So, Johnny, let's talk. Uh, start out about Christian comedy. We've got Christian music. Yeah. We've We've got Christian movies, and we've got Christian comedy. Uh, what makes Christian comedy Christian? Yeah, I don't know. It's the thing. We, we draw those distinctions sometimes in the industry, uh, and I think they're kind of amusing to people who aren't necessarily in the church, because, you know, I meet artists that way. When I was in Christian music, there were a lot of artists who were like, I'm a musician that's a Christian. I'm not a Christian musician. It's like, okay, we're, it's hair splitting just a little bit here. Uh, you know, the, my faith definitely informs the way that I write a joke. Uh, there's words I won't use on stage. But I would say, too, that just my... <laughs> as a comedian, as an artist, my integrity as an artist would say, I like having comedy that an entire family can come see together anyway. Outside of my relationship with Christ, I grew up watching Brian Regan and Jerry Seinfeld, and now Jim Gaffigan is making a huge splash they all work clean. It's like there's so few things you can bring your whole family to. So I would have probably similar convictions about clean, being clean. But I would say, too, as a Christian, my faith definitely informs my comedy because there's a thread through my show of my own life. And it, I grew up in church, and I still attend church. and I, You know what I'm saying? So there's this thing. Uh, when I'm telling about myself, it's going to end up being about my faith in Christ. But... To say Christian comedy, I always am afraid that somebody who doesn't know anything about uh, what we do, that they're just thinking that I have an hour about communion wafers or something, or I'm going to get up there and go, what is the deal with pews? You know, why do they call it a pew? Like, it's not, it's not like that, you know. I was sitting over there in that pew, and then I said, I better move to a cleaner seat. Like, nobody, I'm not telling that. I might write that down. That's a good one. No. Uh, <laughs> you just make that up no, on the yeah. spot. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it's like, you don't want people to think, like we were talking about this before, but when you listen to Christian radio, which I grew up listening to, and I love Christian radio, and there are many Christian artists who I love and respect what they're doing, and the market for that sometimes is like safe for the whole family, and I think that's fine. And I understand what they're meaning that they want a soccer mom who's driving down the road not to feel like she's going to have to cover her kids' ears because of what's right. on the radio. But when I think about comedy, I think that w- comedians are spoke- supposed to speak truth to power. We're supposed to satirize culture. We're supposed to be a little more absurd, not necessarily push the envelope to the point where somebody's blushing. But we're supposed to make somebody think about the way they see the world, maybe more so than uh, even a Christian musician. So I try to make that my goal. The most offensive thing I think a comedian can be is unfunny. (laughs) You know, Mm -hmm. Uh, I mean, offensive is one thing. We're a very offended culture right now. We just can't wait to hit the I'm offended button on social media and say, how dare you have a different opinion than me? To me, I like to be able to go into a place, share my opinion about a subject 
uh, and have somebody laugh, even if they didn't 100% agree with what I said. They weren't offended at what I said, but maybe they didn't even have to agree. Under it. We almost always now, we've lined up in these little pockets of people where we only associate, we only are on social media with people who only espouse our 100% beliefs down to the political and tiny, you know, minutia. And it's like, well, you're going to have like three friends, you know, <laughs> that's all you're going to have. So I love being able to challenge somebody's uh, viewpoint. And many times I'll have people come to my shows that aren't believers and they're hearing me talk about my faith in God in a new way, in a different way. And they're realizing, wow, this is happening in a church. These people are laughing. This is really funny. This is, it's, it opens a new window for that church to now kind of uh, be able to minister to that person in a new way. So I love that. I love that I get to do churches. So Christian comedy as a, you know, as a genre Mm -hmm. is is really kind of on the rise. Why do you think that is? I think that, you know, when we grew up, there were lots of things families could do together. There were even shows we could watch together. We could all watch the Cosby show together. We could all watch Andy Griffith together. Now it's like, it's so, uh, there's, it's so incrementalized. Or even the programming just for tweens, just for 11 and 12 year olds. And just for, you know, the Disney channel has whole stations just for, they're, and so I think families are being segmented in a way, not just by clean versus dirty, but by just content. And so I think that comedy is that universal thing. I do a lot of churches where they've had bands in the year before me. And music is great, but it can be very divisive. If you like, you know, light rock, you're like, oh, mercy me's coming. And then your 14-year-old kid may be like, I'm not going to that. Mm-hmm. And you could drag me kicking and screaming. That's just a that's just a a a, a, a personality thing. That's just a, a preference. But everybody loves to laugh. So if you can make a group laugh that has really difference of ages and, and different generations of people, that's a really neat thing. It's a very powerful thing, you know. It is an amazing thing. You're listening to the Rick Altizer Show on Bot Radio, eighty nine point one FM, eleven sixty AM, Nashville. So is there a uh, community of Christian comedians? Yeah, there's a Christian Comedy Association. Uh, ChristianComedyAssociation.com is that address. That we actually do a conference every year. It's kind of a lonely road if you're a Christian artist in general. I know you started out in music, as did I. And you go out there with a band, and you're like, well, at least it's me and these four guys against the world. But in comedy, it really is. It's you in a hotel room after the show, kind of like, well, let me go see what's open to get a burger. And it can be very lonely. So a while ago, probably 15 years ago or more, uh, Shonda Pierce and some other uh, stand-up comedians who were in this new burgeoning market at the time, they kind of saw the need for it. And they started getting together at her house in Murfreesboro, the funny farm, she calls it. And uh, they started getting together to encourage each other. And and kind of check on each other. And um, it's turned into this thing now where we meet yearly and there's workshops and open mics and showcases and then just a lot of fellowship and, and hanging out. So we get to see each other once a year. And it's usually about, there was about 180 of us this year in Atlanta, which was great from all over the country. So you talked about uh, bands will travel and they'll, mm-hmm. have, they'll have each other. Yeah. A comedian just kind of shows up by himself. Yeah. Stands up there with a microphone, brings his own T-shirts, brings his own yeah. DVDs, and it, you know, and has someone help him maybe man the table while yeah. he's up there. But usually, it's just self-traveling. And I know you went out with Tim Hawkins and yeah. have been touring with him for the last four years. That's right. Is that why Tim is bringing uh, comedians with him? Yeah, I do think it's one of the reasons. I mean, I've talked to him about it before because honestly, I, I always joke with him. I was like this. Taking comedians out with you when you have eight DVDs full of material makes the least business sense of your whole business model. <laughs> and I laugh about it with him because it's coming off his bottom line. Like he pays us out of his pocket to do 15, 20 minutes in his show and kind of introduce his audience to a new comedy voice out there. And he does it because I think he thinks it makes the show better. And I believe it does too. But he's so generous on stage too. Even the way that he does it, he comes out and does time early in the show, brings his quote-unquote opener out in the middle so it's like he's already got them just foaming at the mouth laughing they're just unbelievably on and then he's like hey i'm gonna go in the back take some medication that's what he usually says (laughs) (laughs) i'll be right back and he's like i want to introduce you to your next favorite comedian uh if you don't know who this guy is you're gonna love it and so he sets you up to really succeed now you got to follow tim hawkins which is not the easiest thing in the world to do but it is so and it's taught me a lot about the generosity that you can show to another performer 
on stage, like looking for a creative way to show generosity to another performer. And I've really incorporated that into my own life as I tour. I look for people to bring up in my show that are that are starting out now. And that's because of Tim. For the last four years plus, I've gone out 20 days a year with him. Uh, and we just – we do huge. I mean, he, this is a guy who can fill – 2,000 seats in any market in America, and he has no TV credits, no movie credits. It's YouTube and a grassroots following that just loves him because he was providing something that the, the market needed. Where they needed this family-friendly content that was good and solid and funny. And uh, he always says that to me when people talk about clean, and that's to your point about Christian comedy, what makes Christian comedy. One of my favorite quotes from Tim is, clean comedy is easy. Funny comedy is hard, you know, and that's true. <laughs> so if you just set out to be like, I'm the cleanest comedian there is, well, you might not have said anything of value, but you kept this delineation of I'm a clean com- comedian. I'm a Christian. Okay, I accepted Christ. That does not mean you're going to be funny worth a hill of beans. I, may, I maybe can't stand your show. <laughs> so work, be excellent at what you do and then talk to me about, then share that, well, I have Christ inside. This is, this is, this is my experience through faith. But it's like make sure that what we're using uh, in the marketplace and as an artist is real art. You how know? do you how do you define excellence in comedy? I don't know. I think it, it has to be. To me now, it's changed. Uh, it used to be. I think it was about how quick does it get to the punchline? How many laughs per minute? There's all these gauges that comedians can use on a really kind of uh, uh, pragmatic scale. And now it's more about, did I connect? Did I, did I share enough of myself with that crowd? Did they, did they feel like they knew me at the end of this hour? And because I, and this is what I learned from being a college pastor for five years, too, is you can impress somebody from far away, but to impact them, you got to get up close. It's really hard to get up close when you're on stage and the spotlight's on you and they're in the dark. So to get up close to a crowd, you've got to share parts of yourself that are uncomfortable to share. You know, I uh, I was an awkward kid. I grew up very shy and introverted. So to do this job is kind of an absurd thing now. It's and, and, I, and I talk about that in the show. And I share awkward moments. Most of my material now is made up of things that really happened to me that I'm sharing something that I would have spent probably my teenage years hiding from people. And now I can't wait to share it on stage because I know there's going to be 500 people that are going to be like, yep, that was me too. And that's like a healing moment. It's a way that your jokes aren't a shield anymore. Now they're like this extended arm to connect. It's, it changes, you know. So that's how does what, that bring healing? How, when when well, you share I think, something uh, vulnerable, then how does that connect? How do, you know, how, to me, like a lot of communities talk about the laugh, like it's a drug. You know, like you hear that laugh, it's like a drug. I call it, uh, I used to call it tiny hugs from strangers. <laughs> like you get these little hugs that only a stranger can give you. <laughs> it's like a weird feeling. Uh, and there's something to that. I definitely think if you're not getting laughs, it's a sign something may be wrong with your show. <laughs> but to make the laugh the only thing, like it's a, it's a pretty hollow thing. To me, it's a, a laugh doesn't necessarily represent like this weird pill, like a pharmacy just distributed my little feel-good medicine for the day. But to me now, from a spiritual aspect, it represents like an amen. Like uh, I think a laugh is so purifying and, and healing to a crowd. Hearing another person laugh at something that you also think is funny is it's a it's like a little it's like we're all one. You know, it's like a unifying thing. Even if what you're laughing at is it's completely silly or it's very pointed. Uh you know, we talked about the Christian comedy thing. Much of my comedic much of my comedic stuff about the church is pretty pointed or it's uh kind of looking at some of the things we do and we look at as normal, but they're kind of absurd. If you looked at it from outside the church, I'll make sure that we're looking at everything. For instance, I do a bit about trunk or treat, uh, Halloween, you know, it's like people do these trunk or treat events, which it's fine. Reach your community how you can. But I say, look, my pastor explaining this to the older people in my church is so funny because he's like, look, we can't be out there knocking on doors. It's a different world we live in. What we're going to do is get all the cars in the parking lot, decorate them, we're going to teach kids that car trunks may be full of delicious candy. (laughs) And so it's silly, but it also is kind of like, yeah, it is a little bit weird. We are a little bit. It's not saying let's stop doing it or we're screwed up. It is saying we're just, we're just as broken or we have just as many silly things that we do. We're the body of Christ. We're the agent that God's chosen to use on this world. But I'm telling you, 
we do some funny things in church and we do some messed up things. And so I like doing jokes. About well, I've that. heard you comment on worship, you know, kind of like, yeah, oh, we'll, we'll, uh, you have your jiggy little worship thing you do. That right. I yeah. don't want to do you. <laughs> Here's me being Johnny. Well, no, we do. And I, I t- yeah, the techno. We have techno worship, and uh, we have all kinds of dubstep worship is on its way. Whatever's happening in the world, five years from now, there's going to be a worship band doing it, and, uh, and you know, it's, that's what you can count on. But yeah, I talk about it. I talk about right now. I'm doing a bit about. Uh, I got to meet Chris Tomlin at a worship conference, and I was like, Chris, I love you, man. You're so anointed, but you got to stop writing so many question songs. He's like, what are you talking about? I said, you write a song. It's a question. You don't answer the question in the song. He's like, what do you mean? I was like, how great is our God? <laughs> you know, pretty great. You know? <laughs> I said, he's got, I said, you got one we do at my church. It's called, how can I keep from singing? It's like, how can I keep from singing your praise? There ought to be a part in that song, Chris, where a big choir just goes, we can't. That's all I'm saying. Like, <laughs> help us. Help us help you, you know. But then when I do that bit, I'll say, you know, music on the radio is no different, you know. Christian music got that, but I listen to the oldie station day, the Carpenters, they got question songs, you know. That song should be over in nine seconds. I heard a song today, Why do birds suddenly appear every time you are near? Because I have bread. That's why. (laughs) So you just, so I try to point an equal (laughs) finger at the absurdity of us all, but. For so long, it felt like you could not make fun of anything within the church without it feeling to the church body like you're just punching Jesus in the face. Right. And I think that's really a scary position to be in when we can't take a hard look at ourselves and some of the silly things we do. So that's one thing I try to do. That's not my whole show, but it is a segment of it because I grew up in church. And so, you know, I talk about big ch- growing up in children's church. You learn one thing, you get to big church, it all changes on you. It's scary for a kid. And little church and children's church are like, hey, don't talk to strangers. It's not safe. Don't talk to strangers. You get to big church, your pastor on Sunday morning, shake hands with somebody you don't know. It's just <laughs> the lessons change. So, right. In case you didn't realize it, you're listening to a really nice guy. The Rick Altizer Show on Bot Radio, 89.1 FM, 1160 AM, Nashville. But I but I like that kind of stuff, and it makes me laugh. And so I'm, I'm usually that's usually my criteria. Does this make me laugh? Does this make my friends laugh? It's worth trying on stage. And, and it's and it's interesting that the you made a good point. The church today does seem to be willing to laugh at itself, yeah, and allow you to come in and actually make comments about what we do. That's whereas maybe 20 years ago, mm-hmm. uh, Christian comedy seemed to be about grandma, yeah. Uh, grandma stories, uh, you know, it was, it was a little more corny. Yeah. Uh, and that seemed to be ha- what you could do in church. Yeah, and that's no discredit to those guys because they were all standing on their shoulders because what happened was they had the line that they had to tow because they had just been given somebody's pulpit in essence. And it was like a scary thing of like, I better not say the word pantyhose or whatever mm-hmm. or I'm going to be in trouble. Mm-hmm. Uh, this anecdote has a thing about Elijah, but they're doing a sermon series on Elijah. I can't do this joke. Pastor just pulled me aside and told me. That's just not the same thing anymore. Now, mm-hmm. uh, there's things I wouldn't necessarily joke about. There's things that I don't think need to be said on stage, even though I have freedom in Christ to talk about whatever. There's just things that aren't beneficial to talk about. And so I have I have my own filters. But, yeah, I like the idea of presenting an idea or making some – Somebody look at something through a different lens. It's fun. It's fun as a comedian. It's not like I'm getting away with something. It's like, let's look at this the way it might look to somebody else. You know? Well, I want to kind of transition into something a little bit more serious. You, you, you talked about how laughs were like tiny little hugs yeah. from Friends You Don't Know, uh, which talks about the, needing, the mm-hmm. need for approval. Yeah. Uh, as you know, I've worked with Shonda for years, and we've talked a lot about comedy – for her growing up, she had a lot of pain as a child. Mm-hmm. And so as a child, she was funny uh, because it was a way she deflected pain. Yeah. And then she became a comedian because that's just what she was doing anyway. Right. And, and so, oh, God made you funny. Well, God get, put her in a life uh, and allowed a lot of pain in her life. Mm-hmm. And she deflected that pain through humor. So... I want to ask you personally, in your own childhood, in your own life, does that connect with you, the issue of pain and using humor to deflect pain? Sure, yeah. I mean, I was a super awkward kid and very shy, painfully shy. I was always like a smart aleck. I had 
things I wanted to say. You know, I would hear I would hear a thought. Somebody would say something, and I would think some funny thought. Every now and again, I would blurt it out. It would get a laugh in class. But I was not a popular kid, uh, and I had a lot of. I felt super awkward. My dad was an alcoholic. He was kind of one of those just not around. He didn't even have the courtesy to leave our family. He stayed and then wasn't there. I don't know if you know what I mean, but it was like mm. he was just kind of a checked out. I'm going to be here, but I'm not coming to your games. We're not playing catch. Like, don't you're not going to get you're not going to get nuggets of wisdom from this dad, and. Um, so yeah, I kind of grew up with that. I had a great mom, but it was very, it was painful. And I think to some degree it does make you an approval junkie because you're almost trying to prove, well, I have value. I have worth. This is, I'm special or whatever it is. So yeah, if you don't, if you don't fix it, if you don't deal with that unresolved childhood stuff, you're not going to fix it on stage. It just becomes like well, a I'm, symptom. Well, I'm, I'm talking before the stage. Yeah. I'm talking when you're... When you're seven mm-hmm. and you're feeling all this insecurity right. and pain yeah, because you got an alcoholic dad, mm-hmm. you, you, maybe you're overweight or whatever yeah. you're going through, and you say something funny and all of a sudden somebody laughs. Right. And then how does that feel? Yeah. I mean, yeah, it's, it, it's, it'll change your life. You go, I want more of this. And you don't even know why yet. You just go, oh, I, I got to figure this out. Now, you know, I, I think we've talked about this before, but I think. Uh, the stuff that was so embarrassing that I spent my life trying to figure out how I could keep it from people because I didn't want to look like a weirdo. Now I realize that's the stuff everybody was going through, and it's the stuff that really will connect me to a crowd. Because, and I talk about it in my show. I say nobody's cool. Let it go. The older I get, I real I realize these kids I thought in school just kind of skated through and they were cool. Nobody's cool. You know, uh, they were just mm-hmm. wearing a different mask than mm-hmm. me, mm-hmm. and they had insecurities too. And I say, look, if I fell down in the playground. I'd have to look around and make sure nobody saw me. I didn't lose any cool points. The mm-hmm. other day, I'm putting all my pants in my bedroom. I'm 42, and I made a mistake, and I fell over like a sack of dirt right there <laughs> in my bed. I laid there for 25 minutes. I was like, this is just God telling me it's not time to get up yet, and I, I'll, I'll accept this rest from you, Jesus. You know? <laughs> and so you just I embrace my, the uncoolness of it all, and an audience responds to that. And I think the reason you say, well, you asked me if the healing thing versus deflection there is a healing that comes from seeing that somebody else is going through something that I've been through, and they came out the other side of it. You know, I have a very good comedian friend who's on the other side of a divorce. His wife literally just came in and said, you know, we're done. Uh, mm. I don't love you. I never loved you. That mm. kind of stuff. Heavy. Could not get her to go to counseling. She left. And he had this face like, do I, do I talk about this on stage? How do I make this funny? What do I do? This mm. is painful. And the church still has its own opinions about divorce. Now that he's doing it, he's having more of a, an active ministry than he ever has because people are going through it and they say, I see you come out the other side of it. And I've laughed for the first time tonight. I thought I would never, my life would never mm-hmm, be the same. Mm-hmm. A year ago, my wife did the same thing to me. He's having these ministries. So it opens a door. Uh, it does. And, and that, that's great. To, you know, that's a great point about my pain gives me a connect point because mm-hmm. we all have that pain. Sure. We all have those connect points. And that gives us then an opportunity to put the Christian in Christian comedy there you go. to connect with them, the love of Jesus, and hey, we're both in this together, yeah. and we can laugh about it. And uh, and so, you know, Johnny, thanks for so much for coming and sharing with us today. It's just you very, you know, we went all kinds of different places <laughs> here. And uh, you know, how can people get more information? About uh, Johnny W. Sure. Uh, JohnnyW.com is my website. We're just relaunching that. Uh, J-O-N-N-I-E-W.com. So you can find out all you want there. It links to my social media and all that stuff, too, so you can find out all you need. And uh, you've got a new DVD coming out on September 6th, uh, live at the Franklin Theater here in uh, Tennessee. Mm -hmm. And um, people can go to JohnnyW.com and get more information about that. They can also go uh, to your website and uh, find out about your Facebook page. And uh, you, you do funny tweets on a regular basis and yep. uh yeah please follow me on all that stuff and uh you can keep up with me i'd appreciate it like me like me follow like, me please like me please <laughs> <laughs> well it's been great having you here today thank you so much for doing this and for doing this again i appreciate oh, you johnny man. this is it i hope it recorded you're a you true friend get one more. you're a true friend <laughs> you bet thank you so much for joining me and uh, thank you for listening The music you are listening to is from my scripture memory record, and I want to give it to you for free. Just go to my website, rickaltizer.com, and click Contact. Altizer is spelled A-L-T-I-Z-E-R. Or how about liking my Facebook page, facebook.com slash Show. I want to thank Paul Winkler, the investor coach, for sponsoring this show, and I want to thank you 
for listening. So be sure to check us out again next week as we discuss how we communicate the gospel through media to our culture. Let's be clear so the world can hear. I'll talk to you next week. Thanks for listening. I can